Yeah, my name is Jeff Bronze. Uh, I've known Mike since we were um, 15 and 16 years old, I being the 16 year old. Uh, we, we met through skiing and we've been friends ever since. He was a fierce competitor. He did not want to be second in kind of anything. When we began the season that was the, the Porsche face-off, eight competitions in different areas around the Northwest, it was he and I who were clearly one of us was going to win this thing. The very first con and, and I'd been kind of winning the other little minor contests more than him. And the first one of the Snowbust series that was the Porsche end result, um, when they announced me as second place, his name hadn't been announced yet, and, and he went, yes. And I did too a little bit inside, actually significantly inside. I was glad to see that Mike was going to win one. Now, looking back, I'd rather it had been me because the margin between the two of us in this overall series that year was very, very close. Mike won by three points out of, I don't know, maybe 50 or something like that, whatever the point scale was. And I got second place, which was um, a two-week freestyle camp, someplace in California, might have been Squaw Valley. And in the meantime, I broke my leg and couldn't do that, so I sold that to, sold, sold the camp to somebody else. This, this was in the era before cell phones. I was at work. And uh, after work, I was doing a project for my father at his cabin. And I got there, and he said, Jeff, I have something to tell you. I'm thinking, who died? And it was one of those excruciatingly long moments where I, my mind doesn't know what it is. And it turned out to be a pretty bad thing. My best friend in life, who is the champion snow skier, is now paralyzed. And, and uh, that, that sounds like a pretty dire um, result and uh, I was shocked. I was stunned. I was saddened, but I didn't really understand yet what that would mean. So when I finally was able to spend time with him at the hospital, um, I remember so clearly going in and, and Mike, there was still a fire within Mike, the same old fire that, that made him a champion skier and made him want to be number one at all times. That fire was there. I held his hand and he wouldn't stop just kind of squeezing my hand a little bit. And I said, Mike, it's all right. Save your energy. And so he relaxed that a bit. But he, he wanted me to know just in that, because he was still almost pre-verbal at that time with all the medication. He wanted me to know that he's still in there. And he never went away. It's just a different Mike. And uh, it's so wonderful to see this. That, that, that old Mike is, is back. He's got that fire. He's, he's raging hard to be the best he can be. And he's certainly excelling in this new sport of his, the mono ski sport. He, he didn't let it slow him down. There, there was always a project. Um, he, he helped um, a disabled veteran from the Iraq War who was a quadriplegic. Um, he found funding to completely redo this guy's house. It was a, a very substantial makeover and volunteer efforts uh, for the manpower to make this thing happen. Um, he created um, eco-friendly environment at his home and then also went into business um, creating accessible living spaces for people whose circumstance in life has changed. Fierce, potent, invincible, unflappable, um, honest and true as a friend. And no one knows Mike like I do. Well, there, there are so many highlights from when Mike was a stand-up skier. Uh, one would be the 16-man the backflip, which set uh, Guinness Book world record for the most people holding hands together. That was my year off, so I wasn't there. I had broken my leg and um, was body surfing instead. That wasn't as damaging to my leg as skiing would have been. I wasn't there for that, but, but that, that was a great moment. Uh, together, Mike and I 
we would build a jump uh, right in front of the lodge at Alpental, and we kept that jump manicured all season long. And we would do what we do, you know, I mostly backflips, some fronts. Mike would do his backflips, some front, a lot of front flips, and his signature move, the vowels a copter, which uh, he named not necessarily for himself, but because what he thought he would call it didn't didn't match the rules of comp competition. It's not a, a true daffy. It's a helicopter with a daffy. So he called it the Valsicopter, not for ego as much as for clarity. Um, and we were right in front of the lodge, and, and it was enjoyable for patrons and friends to just after skiing be uh, up in the balcony and watching us do our thing. There was this thing, an, a non-sanctioned, non-sponsored event called the Slush Cup at Mount Baker on the 4th of July. 4th of July. Um, there, there's a natural slush pond or a water pond there and still snow around. And we would go build a jump beforehand and uh, then we and others would jump into the water and, and do tricks and, and stuff. And there was, um, I saw Warren Miller broadcast something on ESPN one time late at night and it's me going off the thing as part of what I just happened upon on television. And I do my backflip and Warren Miller goes, hmm, no brain, no pain. And so there's probably some footage on Warren Miller's cutting room floor somewhere of, of us doing that stuff up there. Well, first let me say that there's really nothing quite like taking off from the snow and being weightless for however long it is. That beginner that just takes the tiniest little jump and feels that charge, that's what I felt. That's, I'm sure, what Mike felt first time he found air. And once we found it, that was the place we wanted to be. And then it was the bigger the better and working the tricks into it. Um, we were inventing it as we went. There wasn't really anybody there with me and Mike to say, oh, do this, do that, build the jump this way. We, we just did it the way it seemed to be working. And uh, it brought attention and interest from others, which was a nice sidelight to the whole thing. Um, today, it's really a different sport. And the way people get into it, I think it has to be coming from a, a different place. Certainly, there's the passion, the love. They, they've all, I'm sure, found their first air, had that aha moment like Mike and I both did. Um, but you need training. What they're doing is crazy scary. I went to the men's finals at the Olympics in Vancouver to see it and I had great seats and I got scared just watching them practice to find the correct speed going down the in run to see how fast they truly go. I was just nervous and as soon as I saw them go and do you know full double full full which is three flips and four twists oh okay they can do it they can do it and they land it every time. And if they just, just a teeny bit off, they miss the podium. They're all so good. So it's a different sport today, but it, I think it germs from the same sense of passion and excitement that can be derived from catching air. It's more than any one thing that's happening. It's more than this event of Mike coming back to skiing. It's more than um, he, his and my friendship together and sharing this event. It's, it's a community of people who care a lot about what they do. Each of us knows there, but for the grace of God, go I. And um, the love that has exuded from so many people for the period of this week and even the period of the year leading up to this week has really been amazing. And I've, I've grown to love Mike more. I, I've grown to love myself more. Um, these, these folks that we have a history with, I haven't seen in 20, 30 years that, or longer. Um, but it's like, you know, because we went through what we went through, kind of defining what early hot dogging or freestyle might be, 
we have a kinship and we respect each other. And one of the things that I knew would be fun, but I didn't know how fun it would be, it would be all the reminiscencing, um, the, the stories, the, um, you know, kind of teasing one another about a fall or what, whatever. It's just been such a riot, and to hear somebody else's perspective of a particular thing has been a very enjoyable part of this that I didn't really anticipate as being that great. But then, you know, we have Mike. We have Mike. He's our leader uh, for this week, anyway. Um, and uh, he just brings that out of people. So, Mike, could you just introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Mike Vowles. I'm 57 years old. I'm a uh, championship level freestyle skier from the 1970s. Uh, one of the contributing pioneers to the sport of freestyle skiing back in 1985, 28 years ago, today, literally today, 28 years ago, exactly today, uh, I hit a tree snow skiing, uh, became paralyzed, and uh, 28 years later I'm back here in Sun Valley and I'm learning how to ski again on a uh, mono ski. Being part of freestyle skiing back in the, uh, in the early days, it was, uh, it was known as hot dog skiing, you know, early on. And uh, it was skiers on the hill uh, that were uh, seeking new, uh, oh, I guess, exploration uh, as far as, uh, you know, taking their, uh, their skiing levels uh, to uh, two new excesses uh, back in the day of like uh, Herman Golner, Tom Leroy, the first guys that were out there doing somersaults and so forth. Uh, it, uh, it became uh, kind of a competitive thing between skiers seeing who could who could you know come up with the next thing who could come up with the next trick uh i think that uh uh you know one of the things about freestyle skiers is uh you're showing off and uh you know there's uh you know as much as i hate to say there's ego involved you know it was uh, it was all about uh doing things that uh you know got a lot of other people's attention so not only uh, did you get to compete with your, your, your fellow skiers and so forth, uh, you know, you were, also, uh, uh, you were also out there in front of the public, in front of people, uh, um, just doing new innovative things that, uh, that really got the, the attention of, uh, you know, people around you and so forth. And so, uh, you know, but more than anything, it was uh, competing against your, your, your fellow skiers to kind of see who could bring it, notch it up to that next level. So there was always that uh, competitive spirit. And with freestyle skiing, there's always also that uh, freedom that came along with uh, just innovation and free thinking and just getting outside the, uh, getting outside the borders, getting outside of the, uh, you know, the, the, the framework of uh, what people kind of think the limits of skiing was. It was always about exceeding those limits of what skiing was. And aerial acrobatics, that is what was my specialty back in the day. Uh, you know, you've got ballet skiing, you've got your mogul skiing. I did all, I did all three events, but it was, uh, it was aerial acrobatics that I, that I learned to excel at. And I did some pretty uh, outstanding things back in my time. I've been in a Dick Barrymore ski film, uh, some stuff that got shot here in Sun Valley during a, 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 in a uh, International Freestyle Skiers Association back in the uh, back in 1974. So I was in and I was in a, a Barrymore film here. Uh, I was also in his uh, film Winter Heat, uh, which is a pretty well-known film, uh, and it was uh, shots of me competing and. Um, Warren Miller, I was uh, I'm in a Warren Miller ski film in probably 1975, and that was uh, uh, in the state of Washington at a ski area called Ski Acres, and we were doing a record-setting uh, backflip. So we were able to do a backflip with uh, 16 guys holding hands, and that was uh, in a Warren Miller ski film. Stan Larson, uh, you know, we, uh, we go back to the same timeline, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
my starting to compete in the sport of freestyle skiing when it was first starting to come up, when competitions were first being held. Stan Larson was a, a, a Seattle resident. He skied at Crystal Mountain. I was from the Suquamish Pass area at Alpenthal. Uh, Stan might have been, uh, he might be maybe five years older than me. So, uh, so he was a guy that was around way back when, and uh, his nickname was Stan the Fly Larson. That was his name, nickname the Fly. Uh, so we go way back, you know, to uh, probably about 1971, maybe 1970, 71, and uh, and he was uh, one of those innovators, and he's a guy that's remained in the ski industry to this day, and now he's a filmmaker, and so it was just so terrific uh, to have uh, both he and Phil Sifferman show up here in Sun Valley over the last few days to come ski with me because it's been, well, it's been 28 years since I got hurt and so many years prior to that that I even met these guys, you know, way back when uh, I was still in high school. Stan was just out of high school, so we've got a, got a lot of history that goes way, way back. I, uh, I started uh, structured ski lessons at eight, age uh, 13. I was in the eighth grade, and uh, so I took ski lessons in eighth grade, ninth grade, and started teaching skiing at age 15. During that time, uh, you know, I just had a passion and a, <clears throat> and a love for just going up and skiing. I absolutely, uh, you know, was falling in love with the sport. And there was guys in our high school that were competing against one another, just kind of see who could do the next thing. And, uh, you know, and there was a guy named Larry Fry in our high school that, that uh, you know, he's a guy that set the standard amongst the guys that I went to school with. And he goes out and he does a front somersault. So when I find out that Larry Fry has gone out and done a front somersault, I wasn't there. But I, you know, first thing I did was I say, okay, where did he do it? Yeah, up at Alpental where we skied. And uh, so I, I went to the same, it was, he was flipping off a cornice. So I went to the same cornice, flipped off that cornice because it's like there's, there's no way I was going to, I was going to let that go. I had to do it too. And uh, that was the bug. That was the bug. I did that first flip off a, a cornice, which is a cliff. And, uh, you know, maybe this was 20 feet tall, something like that. So uh, once that happened, uh, then I started wanting to be able to perfect a front somersault, landing to my skis, skiing away, because this, this first one, it was me landing in powder, you know, relatively safe thing. So uh, from that point, uh, me and my skiing buddies, we started building jumps. We started to try and figure out how to, how to build jump, jumping hills. It was all, uh, we were winging it. We had no instruction, we had no coaching. It was just skiers out there that wanted to have fun. And so as we started uh, doing somersaults, and for me it started as a front somersault, uh, it took nothing to get out there and get some activity going. And before you know it, there's just crowds gathering around our jumping hill. Because back at that time, the things that we were doing were very exceptional. So it would be nothing on a sunny day just to have a packed crowd that would be staying around our jumping hill. And as people are skiing, that crowd would you know, stay there at the same size. So that was one of those things that kind of fed into that, uh, that whole freestyle skiing spirit. We're trying to perfect what we're doing, but we're always being, uh, you know, there was always the showmanship element of it because there was always people there to watch and, and you tended to kind of feed off of that. So then when I got to a point where competitions were starting to show up as the sport of freestyle skiing was uh, first starting to come into its own, uh, to then go to these competitions and, and compete against other guys, like guys like Stan Larson from other ski areas, it just got the, I got the bug. I got the bug, and so over time, over a few years, I started to become a perfectionist at it. So having started with a, uh, a front somersault, uh, a couple years later, I'm eventually doing a full twisting front somersault that I could consistently land, and back at that time, there was maybe three guys in the world that were able to figure out that maneuver, so I was one of those uh, guys uh, raising the bar and setting a, setting a high standard back at that time. So, uh, you know, in the, in the, uh, uh, as a freestyle skiing competitor, one of the things I was, uh, one of the uh, events I was competing in, in the Pacific Northwest, you've got uh, Rainier Beer and the Rainier Beer Snow Bust. And so there are these, uh, you know, Snow Bust Carnival type events that would go from ski area to ski area to ski area. So when I first graduated from high school in 1973, 
you know, I'm all gung ho. I, you know, my goal was to go out and become a, you know, professional freestyle skier. That's all I could think about. And so, first year out of high school, the Rainier Snow Bus that always had jumping competitions, and you could win TV sets and skis and radios and you know that kind of thing. So, uh, first year out of high school, they're uh, giving away a year's lease on a Porsche 914. So uh, I set my, my sights on that. Uh, I'm, I'm rooming with uh, Jeff Bronze, my best friend to this day. So, uh, you know, and Jeff was uh, an exceptional gifted athlete and he was, he was the one fully expected to win this Porsche. He, he, he had the gift, he had the natural talent. And uh, so I was competing against Jeff but I was getting better, I was getting better. Jeff had the natural talent, but, uh, but I had that work ethic. I had that work ethic, and, and I, so I'm, I'm pretty much starting to uh, get to where I'm staying nose to nose with Jeff. We go off to a place called uh, Silverhorn in Idaho, and I think in that event, uh, you know, I win the event, Jeff is second place. Next event, Krista Mountain, uh, J Jeff wins, I'm second place. So we're kind of nose to nose, and I've got to figure out a way to beat this guy. And so I just threw that freestyle skiing spirit and innovation and coming up with another bag of tricks, something I'm going to do. Uh, I, uh, I came up with a jump where it was a, a combination of a 360, where I'm spinning 360 degrees upright, and then throwing in what's called a daffy move, where my, my skis are splitting in a, uh, you know, like the splits. And uh, so all of a sudden I had the combination of these two things come together and it just, uh, it was, nobody else could figure it out. Nobody else could figure out how to do this thing I was doing without crashing. So I got dialed in on this thing and it was, uh, it was, uh, it was almost like it was, uh, 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 it, it had a, like an artistic element to it. Like when you see ballet dancers springing up off the, off the floor and doing incredible things. Nobody else could do this thing. So uh, it was a helicopter, Daffy. I started scooting ahead of Jeff and you know, I found myself in a position where I had something where I, I you know, I can now start setting my sights on winning this Porsche better because now I had a new, you know, something in my bag of tricks. So uh, I successfully won that Porsche and it was because of my, what became known as the Valsicopter. Uh, but in that uh, competition, uh, competing for the Porsche, it was not known as a Valsicopter. It was this helicopter Daffy and it wowed the crowds and everybody loved it. So it was when I came to Sun Valley here in 1974, and uh, that year inverted aerials were uh, uh, not allowed, and it had to do with some, you know, some serious injuries that took place. Uh, so the uh, inverted aerials were not allowed. So bringing that jump here to Sun Valley, uh, I really had a good chance of uh, competing against some high-level guys nationwide, and you know, and I can be in that that top ten easily. So uh, you know. End of the day, I end up with 24th place here in Sun Valley, and I'm kind of scratching my head like, you know, how can that be? How do I get 24th place with the stuff that I'm doing here? So I uh, went to one of the judges afterwards, and I just said, hey, give me some help here. I, you know, I do this jump, and, you know, and I, you know, and I would imagine I'd be, you know, doing better in the standing. So tell me as a judge, what is it you're looking for? What am I doing wrong? And so they explained to me that, uh, you know, with me calling it out as being a helicopter, and doing a daffy, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't that clear that I was doing a daffy because it, it was more of an art form kind of a thing. And every time I did it, the jump was always slightly different, but it was incredible to watch, but it was more of an artistic thing, and a, but it wasn't truly a daffy. And uh, so then I went to Jackson Hole, Wyoming next for the next uh, competition. And so there I just said, okay, you know, in my flight plan, you know, you've got to, you know, let them know what you're going to do. I said, I'm doing a vowels a copter. So I do my vowels a copter and I went from 24th place doing the same exact jump and now I'm coming in sixth place. So I'm within the top 10 of uh, competing against the, the best guys in the United States. And so the name vowels a copter was born as a way to, you know, be judged differently because nobody could tell me how to do my own jump. It's just mine and I'm the only one doing it. So the day of my accident uh, is today's date. It was uh, March 24th, 1985 on a Sunday, as today is also a Sunday on the anniversary of that. Uh, I was actually scheduled to not be on the hill that day. I've got a log house that I built and uh, 
That day I was scheduled to be uh, on my property. A portable sawmill was going to be brought out and I was going to be sawing logs into lumber with a guy. And he called and uh, canceled the night before because we had uh, rain in the forecast. So my buddy Dennis, who's here in Sun Valley today, uh, he calls me up and says, hey, you know, you want to go skiing tomorrow? And it's like, you know, it was a no brainer. And I said, yep, I'll go because I, you know, my, my, you know, my commitment was gone. So I went skiing with him that day. So it was a, it was a sunny day, spring day. Uh, you know, we had some fresh snow, just a, a beautiful, wonder day, wonderful day on the hill. Uh, people that are here in Sun Valley right now uh, that were on the hill with me that day uh, include uh, Mike Burris, Bob Mooney, Debbie Stotzenberg, Al Osborne, Dennis McCormick, who we drove, I drove up with that day. So it was uh, just another wonderful day at Alpental. I've got my wonderful, you know, ski and peers friends that are on the hill around me. You know, sometimes we'd all be together. Uh, you know, sometimes we'd, you know, be breaking into smaller groups. But when I got hurt, uh, there's a, a run called Side Slip Shoot. And it's called Side Slip Shoot because, uh, you know, most people side slip it. Uh, and to describe the, uh, the terrain, it's, uh, it's a very steep, fairly narrow chute. It's about uh, maybe, you know, 25 feet wide. On the left-hand side, you've just got towering cliffs above you that, you know, kind of have a daunting effect. To the right, it drops off to the right, and you've got forest. And uh, so, you know, side slip chute, you know, the guys that I ski with and the way I skied it is we'd just ski straight down that thing at a high rate of speed and uh, and it was uh, one of the most challenging runs on the mountain one of the most dangerous runs on the mountain and it's one of the runs that that the guys that I skied with we we skied at the hardest and the greatest and it was it was one of those uh, it was one of those runs where uh, you ski it well and you know you're gonna go home with a great day so uh, uh, when I got injured uh, Debbie Stotzenberg, Al Osborne, uh, Mike Burris, Bob Mooney, we were all together and when we approached Side Slip Shoot it was Bob and uh, Mike that were with me and we got a little bit ahead of the group. So uh, Bob and Mike skied down first and so they're waiting at the bottom of the hill and then they're waiting for me to come down so at the top of the chute as I start my uh, as I start my you know my drop into into side slip chute, uh, rather quickly I, I hooked a right inside edge, and when I did, it took my my right ski and it rose it up and it put it behind me. So when that happened, instead of heading down side slip chute where I was intending to go, it started pulling me toward the forest. So now I'm moving in the direction of the forest, and I'm uh, I'm doing what's called a high speed recovery, on one ski. I've done it a million times, and this was the time where I was pretty much out of nickels. Out, the sand in the hourglass was gone. It was no longer my moment to uh, be able to pull out of it. So, you know, I'm heading toward the forest, and I actually, you know, recover as far as my high speed recovery. I get both of my skis back underneath me, but I'm going faster and faster. Now the train starts dropping out from underneath me. So it wasn't like I was flying off a cliff, something like that. But the train just starts dropping off out, out, out from underneath me. So uh, I'm seeing myself coming straight on to a tree that's maybe, you know, ten, eight to 10 inches in diameter, but I'm, I'm, I'm heading straight for that tree. So, uh, you know, and it was uh, one of those moments where you kind of get into that slow motion effect because as, as I'm coming at that tree, I'm thinking to myself, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm talking to myself and it's, it's happening so fast, but I got time to talk to myself and I'm just pretty much saying, this is gonna hurt. But, you know, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm going home sore from this one, I'm, you know. But as I'm heading toward that tree, I, rather than take it head on, I started turning my head to the left because if I turn my head to the left, it's going to rotate my body. Wherever my head goes, my body's going to go. And I know that because I was the champion guy at doing 360 degree spins. So, but I can't change my tra trajectory. I'm, you know, that, that I don't get to influence. But by, by turning, I, uh, I didn't take the tree head on, but I took it in the back. I pretty much took it square in the back. And when I did, I'm, uh, I'm maybe 
you know, four to six feet off the ground. So I'm not skiing when I hit the tree. I'm airborne when I hit the tree. And it was the trunk, you know, it was, uh, you know, I wasn't going into branches. I was going into the trunk of the tree. So I, I took it in the back and uh, my vertebrae burst at, at, at the level of what I, you know, tell people is about my sternum level. So my vertebrae burst, so there's the first trauma. Then the next trauma is me with a burst vertebrae. Now, I've, now I'm dropping to the snow. So now I've got that, that that's kind of that second trauma. Um, and I landed uh, upside down, or when, I shouldn't say I landed upside down. Once I hit the snow, I'm on, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on very steep terrain. So I just found myself lying on the snow, upside down in a very steep situation. And, and I just, I, I know, I've paralyzed, I've broken my back. There's no question in my mind. That's what I've done to myself, and I know that. So I'm hanging upside down, and one of the first people to me is Debbie Stotzenberg, who's here today on the mountain. And because uh, Bob Mooney and uh, Mike Burris, they're down the hill looking up. And so Debbie arrives on the scene, and I just said, Debbie, I've broken my back, I'm paralyzed, and I need, I need to get turned around. I can't stay upside down like this because I'm, I'm certain I would have died had I stayed upside down. I, I couldn't with the blood rushing to my head with the trauma to my body. So then I uh, when you know, so I tell her I, I've got to get turned around. So by that time, Mike and uh, Mike Burris, Bob Mooney got up the hill to me and I told him, you turn me around, guys. I can't take my skis off. I can't stay like this. So there's that uh, third possibility for trauma to one's body because you're not supposed to move anybody with a spinal cord injury, but it had to happen. And I'm, I'm sure it hasn't, hasn't had any more ill effect. I already, already done the damage, but they got me turned around. And um, so uh, then it was, became that waiting game where uh, the patrol gets notified, ski patrol gets notified, and I am just in excruciating pain. And all I know is, pain. I'm not thinking about tomorrow. I'm not thinking I can't walk. I'm not thinking I can't feel my legs. All I know is just extreme pain and I just want to get off that mountain and I'm hoping I'm going to get helicoptered off that mountain, which turned out that didn't, that wasn't the case. So I had to go down, uh, you know, in an ambulance. Uh, so then one of the first guys upon the scene that is here in Sun Valley right now is Bill Sokolich. So he's joining me for my return to skiing, and he was one of the first responders. And so, you know, he, uh, and, this, and this starts the conversation about the, uh, the impact on other people's lives, how hard this was on everyone for me to get hurt like this. Uh, Bill Sokolich is a guy that, uh, you know, maybe he's five, six years older than me. And he watched me grow up at Alpental from age 14. He watched me develop into a freestyle skier of a championship level. And, and Bill gets the call and he finds out who he's going to help, who he's going to get off the mountain, and, and then I'm paralyzed. And uh, so, uh, you know, after that, it was a matter of getting me down in the toboggan, and all I knew was pain. And, in the, uh, and it was Debbie who rode down in the ambulance with me. And it was just nothing but pain. That's all I knew. I, you know, I couldn't even go anywhere else in my mind. All I could do is just try and manage that pain. So once we got to the hospital, to the emergency room, uh, they, you know, they had to do the x-rays and all that kind of stuff before they could finally put me on morphine or whatever they put me on. And, uh, and during that time, I had some uh, internal bleeding going on. And they don't know what the source of that is, but there was concern that I might have ruptured my aorta. So uh, this being back in the days where there's no cell phones, that kind of thing, Debbie is there all alone uh, because everybody else is following behind coming down you know to, to join us at the emergency room at the hospital so then Debbie gets approached by the uh, chaplain you know so all of a sudden here's poor Debbie there with Mike you know going through all that and you know and they're talking to her like this might not go well you know he might not we don't know if he's going to survive and luckily you know within half an hour or so she got the good news that i uh it was uh you know i i had uh, ruptured a lung and so it was bleed bleeding was coming from a source different than my aorta and i was going to live so there you are there's that piece so when uh you know when it happened when i became paralyzed uh you know i uh 
I did physical therapy for four solid years and I was hell bent on beating paralysis. I was absolutely certain I was going to be able to put forth the energy and I was going to be the guy that was going to beat those odds. And uh, the surgeon that worked on me, uh, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm thankful that, uh, you know, the way he said it to me is he said, Mike, you got a one in 500 chance of walking again. And to this day, I thank that man. His name was Howard King. And I thank that man for saying it like that because I just said, good. I'm going for it, you know, as opposed to the guy just saying, you will never walk again. Uh, I think that would have been inappropriate. I like, I like the odds he gave, and I gave it four solid, solid years, and then I finally got to the point where I just said, this is, this is bigger than me. I, you know, I, I'm done. I, I can't do that. Uh, but through that time, all that energy, all that effort, all that intensity, all that discipline, it gets transferred into other things in the rest of my life so uh, you know it was it was time well spent and it was my way to do it uh, because I had a lot of uh, resistance from you know the therapy community the doctors uh, thinking I was you know uh, wasting my time and uh, and maybe uh, causing an ill effect to myself of not accepting it it was just my way I need I needed to know at the end of the day when I stopped my effort that it was, uh, it was me. It was not, you know, I, I couldn't just take that standard, you know, uh, I, I couldn't be, uh, you know, what's the term, status quo. I couldn't just say, okay, if you say so. I had to know on my own terms, this is unbeatable. And when I did that, you know, that, that was my way and it was the best way. And then I was able to move forward and, you know, the first thing I did was, you know, uh, go back to finishing the construction of my home and so forth. Um, with respect to skiing, I, uh, you know, the choice I took is, uh, you know, skiing was a perfect thing I did. It was, uh, it was a love of my life, and uh, and I just put it up on a shelf, put it in a crystal case, and I just said it's perfect. That's it. That chapter's over. And I'm not going to ever ski again. I have to. I have to. Uh, I have to finish this thing right now, being perfect. And I, you know, and so the idea of uh, coming back and skiing differently in any different fashion, uh, the whole mono ski thing, it was in its cruder form, uh, just beginning at that time. And uh, and I wanted nothing to do with it. And I don't think it was from an egotistical standpoint. I just, you know, I had something perfect and I wanted it to stay that way. So for 28 years, uh, that was my position. Uh, periodically, somebody would approach me about, you know, have you ever thought about the mono ski and Mike? I, you know, I see guys up the hill and it's, you know, and I would always say, hey, I, I am, you know, I've got to just say I am, I'm impressed and I say more power to those people. That's just not, that, that is not my way. That's just, you know, what I did, I need to leave it, I, I need to always reflect on its perfection. So uh, that went on for, uh, you know, maybe about 26 years. And about two, two and a half years ago, I started suffering depression. And when I started suffering depression, I knew, man, things are, something's terribly wrong. Something's terrible, because I'd never ever experienced depression. But now I know I was probably always just five steps away from depression all that time. But I always remained, you know, uh, in a good state of mind, but I also was living excessively with everything I did in my life. I put excess into everything. And that is a, uh, it is a side effect of a traumatic experience. And that was one of my coping tools, but eventually Something happened, and uh, and the depression set in. So I started working with uh, a, uh, a, psych a psychotherapist uh, to get to the bottom of uh, what is that? Because I, you know, I was sick, and I needed to, uh, you know, get to the root of it, uh, and 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 get it taken care of. So through that whole process, I started learning a lot about myself. I started started learning a lot about this traumatic event, and uh, so through that process. I started becoming more open and available to the possibility of returning to skiing. So it was a it was a slow kind of a process. And one way I, I've come up with this story that I've told a few people, and that story being that uh, when I got hurt, 29 years old, 
peak of my physical you know, prowess, my skiing skills. When I got hurt, I had an out-of-body experience, and that skier inside me rose up and left. But he didn't come back down into me. Instead, that skier traveled into the future, looking for when the time is right. So 26, 27 years later, when, when, when these changes started happening and the depression set in, I started doing the therapy, uh, I, uh, you know, my story is, is that skier, you know, was waking me up and saying, it's time. And, and that out-of-body experience, that skier's back. That skier came back. I'm, uh, I'm whole and I'm complete again because that skier has been my core. So that's just the way I tell that story. Uh, so I uh, refer to myself as being a time traveler because now being back skiing, the sit ski uh, has developed. So you've had all this hard lifting over the years. So when I come back, I've got the advantage of all these people that have done all this hard work. The equipment's better, the, uh, the shape ski has an influence on it, the ski hill grooming is different than it ever was, uh, I've never worn a ski helmet, so all of these things are so, so different, but now that I'm back, it's, it's, it's like it happened just yesterday, and I feel very much as though I'm right on schedule, and when people have talked about, you know, Mike, hey, uh, do you wish you'd done this earlier now that you're here? No, this is my time, I'm on schedule. I'm supposed to be here now, and it's perfect. It's, it's perfect again in the strangest sort of way. It's perfect again, this experience that I've had over this last week and just kind of where I see things going now. Yeah, the first day over at uh, Dollar Mountain, I'm skiing on the chair called Quarter Dollar, and, uh, and it couldn't have possibly been more, uh, you know, more uh, uh, intimidating, intense, uh, me feeling vulnerable. I'm learning to ski a different way, I'm taking ski lessons, I'm the beginner student from day one, uh, and now I have to find out how to use my body with the lower part being paralyzed, I don't have uh, feeling, I don't have sensation, so there's so many things that, that I don't have to, uh, to give me feedback from the snow on up, so uh, it's been one heck of a very difficult, daunting challenge this week. Uh, let's see, today being Sunday, this, I think this is going to be like the eighth, this will be the seventh day of my ski lessons. So it's, uh, it's gone real well, <clears throat> but difficult, you know, I hate to use the fr word frustrating, but you know, it's in there and, uh, and it's been one heck of a challenge and uh, I guess vulnerability is, is the word I like to keep coming back to uh, because to have gone from who I was as a skier at one time, and then to return in this situation where uh, I'm gonna take on this task of learning to ski again differently in a mono ski. Uh, the greatest thing that has come out of this week is, uh, you know, my, my I, male friends, and, but also Debbie Stotzenberg, being with me and, uh, and, and catering to me, doting over me as they're part of my support group with the mono ski. Uh, and, uh, and just the amount of uh, hands-on uh, experience I've had with these friends that are so protective of me while I'm really vulnerable. And, uh, you know, this last week, it's like jokingly, we talk about these guys being like my pit crew, you know, uh, helping me clean off my ski goggles, helping me get buckled in this thing, keeping me from tipping over. <clears throat> and all the while, I've constantly got people's hands on me. People, you know, you know, riding up the chairlift. Somebody's always holding on to me without me asking. It's like uh, I'm being uh, I'm being protected by these people, and that has been this incredible human experience I've had with my best friends. And uh, and one part about this time here in Sun Valley, it's a giant therapy session because. There was so much hard crying that took place 28 years ago that was grieving and there's just a lot of crying going on around me right now that is uh, joyful tears of celebration and uh, so this trip to Sun Valley has been unbelievable as far as uh, how well I've done on the uh, quickness of my uh, developing the skills so I, I'm really feeling very good about my return to skiing and the people factor and just the love that surrounded me, it's just, it's, 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 it's unimaginable and it's, yeah, it's just off the charts.
Yesterday was, uh, you know, an untethered day for me where Mark Mast, you know, my mentor, my coach, my ski instructor, my new friend, uh, he's unleashing me. And, uh, you know, and I'm kind of a high risk guy because I'm, you know, I'm like that dog that's on that leash leaning forward and, uh, and, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm getting back into, the, into that mode of coming back as a skier. And uh, so yesterday to reunite on the hill with 30 plus skiers from my past, it's a sunny day. Uh, you know, I, I'm just, you know, enveloped by this, this group of people, this, this love. And so uh, yesterday was one of the most incredible days for me as a new, newly born skier, a mono skier. It was so incredible because uh, this week that I've been going through these lessons, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm stressing, I'm thinking, I'm stressing. Uh, I'm talking to myself about all these things that I'm being taught. Going down the hill, I'm talking out loud and I'm, I keep talking to myself to try and, you know, get this information in my head, but also while I'm trying to, uh, you know, have my body pick up and learn something new and start to, uh, you know, use different senses to do this. So yesterday was a day where I was just out skiing on the mono ski and I was giving no thought to anything other than I was just skiing. So when these 30 plus people, you know, converged on the top of the mountain, they're there surrounding me. Then we came skiing and these guys are all behind me. It really just changed the dynamics. I was no longer thinking about how to ski. I was just skiing and at a high rate of speed and the people power, the energy that I got from the group was just tremendous and it was uh, amazing how it affected me. And of course, it's amazing how it's affected them because, you know, it's, yeah, it's been quite a week for all of us. But yesterday, being untethered, skiing fast, wind to my face, uh, incredible, just absolutely incredible. At this point, uh, you know, it, because uh, I've imagined, imagined, I've imagined coming into this you know, I see these, I see these uh, great skiers, mono skiers doing just great things of an incredible athletic level. Uh, and I've just imagined I'll probably do pretty good. I mean, you know, I'll probably do pretty good. And uh, so, you know, and I would have, you know, I would forecast and imagine, you know, prior to this that I'll be continuing this. But to be here now, to do what I've done, to, uh, to having, uh, having the learning curve being as short as it is, how well I'm doing now, skiing with my friends, the experience, you know, getting back into that experience, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. I am back, I'm a skier, and I am going forward as a skier from here, you know, because that uh, out-of-body experience, man, that skier, he's back. We are one again. And uh, so my next step is to uh, get my own mono ski. So that'll be my next goal. Uh, get my own mono ski, get, get custom fit, and, uh, and start uh, this renewal process of me coming back into skiing and have it be a part of my life again because it was always a, uh, a core part of my life, just absolutely core. And that was one of the things that when I got injured, it was... Uh, you know, there's there's using the, the the loss of my the use of my legs and all kinds of other bodily functions that are screwed up from a spinal cord injury. Uh, that's all just just you know devastating for anybody. And you know, so for me, it was it was all of the losses that all guys would experience, or you know, anybody would experience with a spinal cord injury. But the, the loss of, of, of my, my skiing core, because that's my soul, uh, it's back. And uh, so, you know, I've got this, you know, I, I'm in a place where at age 57, I'm in great shape. Um, you know, I got, I got a lot of good stuff ahead of me that gets to make my life bigger now. And I've led a big life. I've led a very good life. But it gets to be bigger now. And, 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 and so it's uh, so unbelievably exciting to now be on the other side of this thing. And it's, you know, I, I feel like it's perfect, you know, what's happening right now. It's just perfect. By default, you know, I'm the guy that's considered the role model. I've always been the guy that, you know, people look to and they're inspired by in this, this and that. Uh, so uh, absolutely, uh, you know, because one of the things I, uh, you know, I want to do with uh, this whole process 
is I want to be out, uh, you know, uh, I want to be out doing public speaking. I want to be out sharing this, this, this documentary ski film. Uh, I want to be out helping and serving others that are in my condition or similar because I've led a very good, good life as a paralyzed individual. And there are people out there, their hardships are greater than mine. So I'm hopeful that I can find ways to, uh, you know, not only, uh, you know, set the example, but also to try and raise money and do things on a nonprofit level to help people. And the more I get to tell my story, show my story, the more I get to heal. Because my story has been bottled up for 28 years, bottled up, and uh, that's not a good thing. And so from here forward, I get to share that, release it, put it out there for others, and, uh, and hopefully just, you know, create some, some, some sort of benefit from my disadvantage that I've had in my life. And uh, so that's, that's my answer. What am I gonna do right now? In about uh, an hour and a half, I'm gonna be out there on that hill and I'm gonna be skiing. Today is kind of a, a loose float day where you know we don't have any you know, hard set things that we're gonna be doing on the hill. There's still a handful of people still here that uh, haven't left yet because some people have been returning back to their you know, respective homes. So I'm gonna be out, uh, out skiing on the hill today. Uh, I'm hoping to take it you know, nice and easy. And uh, it's like I ran into uh, Jack Sibok last night and, uh, and he said he's gonna be on the hill today. So I said, well, if I see you, uh, you know, it'd be nice if I could you know, take a couple turns with you. I get to say that. I get to say, I can, I get to say that to anybody. You know, I'm on, you know, let's meet up, let's do a couple turns. Wow, today I'm gonna be skiing and there's gonna be different people out there and I'm gonna go take a few turns with them. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a very magic thing. It's a very magic thing. And this entire week that I've been here, it's like my buddy Jeff and I, We've been on a magic carpet ride. I mean, it, it just has been start to end. We've been on this magic carpet ride and so much, you know, has to do with skiing and so much has to do with people. So this is my, this is a perfect week. Today will be a perfect day. Yeah. It's been a very good day. It's, uh, oh man, I'm, uh, I'm excited. I feel very rewarded. Uh, I feel very stimulated. I uh, I feel like I had a good day. I feel like I did a good job, and uh, the finish was uh, a lot better than the start. It just feels like I'm supposed to be here. It, uh, yeah, it all felt natural. It all felt right, uh, and not terribly overwhelming. You know, I mean, considering it's been 28 years, this was just fantastic. Just fantastic. And a key to that, this is probably the worst day on lower on quarter dollar in five to ten years as far as snow conditions go. And he did pretty good. Really good, especially considering the conditions. In the last few runs were things were starting to click a little bit. And tomorrow we're going over the lower river. And my goal today was to go to Lower River Run tomorrow. So yeah. That's a perfect day. I think we're looking forward to it tomorrow.